Yeah, it's part of why I do stand-up comedy is to be in the center of thought, of, of things that are happening, because my fear is that I'm not funny any longer, but no one has told me. <laughs> Director, writer, producer, and stand-up comedian Judd Apatow is behind some of the funniest movies and TV shows made in the last 30 years. From Freaks and Geeks to this month's The Big Sick, Apatow has made a career out of finding and nurturing unexpected stars. We talked about his path through Hollywood and how he thinks about launching others, as well as what it's like to work in an industry that's changing so fast. Judd, thank you very much for joining us. Good to be here. I think one of the most interesting things about your career is that you've known since you were 10 mm -hmm. that this is something you've wanted to do, that comedy yes. is the area you want to be in. Mm -hmm. What made you realize that this was something you had to do? Well, lucky for me, it wasn't something that I had to come around to. It was just there from such an early age. And I think in my head, I thought, I need a thing that I'm better than everybody at. And early on, I thought, well, something with entertainment and comedy, and mainly because no one was interested in it. There wasn't a second person watching comedians on The Tonight Show. Now there is because the internet and comedy's become such a giant business. But back then, in the late 70s and early 80s, just no one cared at all. And I like that. I like that I've had found a, a niche for myself. And then I was always just trying to figure out, all right, what can I do next to make this path happen? And for me, in addition to just watching everything and reading everything, I became a dishwasher at a comedy club just to watch the show. Everybody told me it was going to take a long time, so I, I didn't have that sense of I'm behind. I always felt ahead because I started when I was 17, mm -hmm. so even when I was 20, 21, I thought, you know, if this all starts working out when I'm 30, it's, it's okay. And uh, it was daunting how good certain people were because I, I lived with Adam Sandler and I was... Uh, friends with people like David Spade and Rob Schneider, and I would open for Jim Carrey and write some jokes for Jim Carrey, and I felt like, yeah, these are, you know, these are supernovas. When you made the move to writing, uh, you went to the Gary Shandling show. One of the things that you were known for as you made this transition was you really were pushing back hard against the studios. Mm -hmm. That when people gave you notes, you were yes. famously refused to accept yes. notes. What was going on that you didn't want this kind of oversight of that you thought that you needed to push back so hard? Well, a hard thing with comedy is um, no one knows if anything's going to work. There's just no way to predict it. Early in my career, I just, you know, I just had an instinct that if, if I think it's right, I should try to just do it the way I think it works. And I remember when I was doing the Ben Stiller show, which was a sketch show for Fox, I went to uh, my manager's partner who was running in Living Color and I asked him for advice. And he said, Judd, if you do their notes and they're wrong and then they don't pick up your pilot, they won't apologize. So just make sure you go down with your ship. You, 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 know, you need to do it the way you want to do it and succeed or fail. That leads to can I collaborate with executives and take notes and find a way to have that process be healthy. But at the time I didn't know how to do that. So I would get a lot of notes and I would say, well, I'm not doing any of them. What happens now? Paul Feig has said that you are, has called you a feedback machine. Has talked about the fact that when you finish a movie, you take a three hour cut, you give it to everyone who's in your focus group almost, a bunch mm -hmm. of people, and you say, give me every yeah. note you've got. So clearly you do want some feedback. Yes, I do want the notes. I just want to be in control of whether or not I have to do the notes. And what happens is that early in your career, when you haven't made anybody money, no one trusts your judgment. So if I do Freaks and Geeks and it gets canceled in the middle of the first season, and then I do Undeclared and it gets canceled in the middle of the first season, when I do a series of TV pilots after that, no one thinks I'm going to be correct. And so when we start having disagreements, I lose because I've never made anyone money. And then as soon as some of the movies made money, people backed off a little bit and thought, oh, maybe he has a sense of this thing that he does. And that collaboration got easier. But when I make a movie, I mean, the process is to have the first rough, long cut, bring all your friends in and, and people who aren't your friends and just say, what do you make of this? and then fix it, and then do it again with, with friends and uh, advisors. But you're the one who gets to make the decisions make about the decision. right. And then I bring it to real people, and then I take you know, 300 people in a mall, and, and then listen, what are they understanding? What, you know, is it 
communicating the way I want it to and do that three to five times. You work with everyone. You work mm -hmm. with Amazon, Netflix, mm -hmm. HBO, all yeah. the studios. Mm -hmm. You're willing to do the new media as well yes. as the traditional media. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between working with them all? I, I really feel like it's an experimental phase. It, it's hard to know. I have a very long relationship with HBO. They gave me my, my first job. I worked for Comic Relief, the charity in 1986, and have worked almost you know, straight through on the Larry Sanders show, on Girls, uh, over the years, and it's a very smart place with you know executives who care about doing great work. It is a, a special place where they encourage people to be creative. Uh, I'm doing a Gary Shandling documentary for them right now. I just sold them a documentary about the band, the Avet Brothers, that's going to air in January, and so that's been very rewarding. And then you have you know a situation at a place like Netflix where we sold them this TV show. Love that's on now, and when we sold them uh, the pilot, instead of shooting a pilot, they ordered two seasons of the show, and that's just an incredible head start when you're trying to do television. And we've had a great experience with Netflix, and and I'm doing my stand-up special for Netflix in uh, Montreal at Just for Laughs in a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. and then Amazon bought The Big Sick at Sundance. And that's interesting to see, here's how Amazon is going to use you know, their position to try to get this really special movie out into the marketplace. And so I feel like at the end of a year or two, I, you know, I, maybe I'll have a better sense of what seems to be functioning best, or maybe it all works yeah. well. Do you think about the, how the industry is changing around you? I think about the entities uh, treating creative people well, mm -hmm. and that that being a rational process, people being supported, being, people being promoted. It's always good that there's multiple places, that there's competition that's good for creative people, it's good so creative people can get paid, and that seems to be happening. And you don't get any, any numbers back from them, right? You don't know how something is done on Netflix? You get a vague, work. Yeah, it's good, or, oh, it's great, or, I don't know. <laughs> Do you like getting the ratings? Do you like getting the opening box office numbers? Is that important to you? I like to know if anyone's paying attention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I like to have some sense of that. I think that people consume things so quickly. I'm looking for the moment when I can have a conversation with the audience. And the numbers tell you whether you have had that conversation or not? Well, you know, part of the numbers is just, you know, are people excited by what yeah. you're doing and, and at what level? So. You know, it's an interesting part of the business. I understand certainly why Netflix doesn't want that to be how their business is run. I think it frees them up in, in numerous ways because people love a horse race. They would love to debate the exact number on every single item right. on Netflix. And for them to not have to be pulled into the press of their numbers frees them up to make a lot more creative decisions for creators, we'd like to know, uh, you know, like, how we doing? Right. You know, it's helpful, but I certainly get it. And it's fascinating uh, that nobody knows. It's really interesting. I wonder if it'll hold. We'll see. You're well known for finding and nurturing talent, especially kind of unexpected talent, maybe faces or people that wouldn't have made it in the Hollywood star system. Do you have a secret or is there something that you have found over the years works well for you for spotting someone and saying, this is someone I want to make a star, someone I want to have a starring role in one of my shows or movies. I like people who are like, you know, a mess with a good heart, who are trying to figure out how to make it through this life and find love and success and, and that that journey is going to be difficult. You know, I like wounded people that are good down deep. So generally that's what I go to. I'm not into like the perfect action hero gorgeous, strong, kick-ass types of characters. I, I, I like the, I'm a Norm from Cheers guy. You know, I, I used to say, I'd like the Born Identity more if it starred Norm from Cheers. <laughs> yeah. Do you find you have some people who are indispensable to you? Yeah, oh, sure. I mean, when I was working uh, a lot with Seth uh, Rogen and Evan Goldberg, Seth was an actor on The 40-Year-Old Virgin, but at the same time, he was co-writing Joba Taylor. Him and Evan were writing Pineapple Express and punching up super bad and you know we were just you know praying that any of these things would would work out and they really inspired me in my writing and their point of view uh, was very inspirational to the style of a lot of the 
work that I was doing. So, you know, when it works, it, it's helpful to everybody. I learned so much working for Lena Dunham. And so, you know, we collaborated together, but I felt like it gave me more courage in my own writing and directing, seeing how brave she was. So it, it's always a really healthy relationship. You were so open about dealing with self-esteem issues, mm -hmm. yeah. about not knowing whether you're as good as someone else mm -hmm. or whether what you've made is any good or not, or will, will you put something out and you're not sure it's, if it means that the next time you do something, it's gonna be any good. Mm -hmm. How do you survive in an industry that is that has so many trends where new people come in all the time, where there are fewer yeah. and fewer barriers to entry, and have those questions about like, am I, am I good at what I do? On one level, it might be healthy because I, I just feel like I'm on a first date always. I don't feel like any success I've had means the next one will be successful. And it keeps me on my toes and I have a lot of energy to succeed because I, I, I just don't get cocky or lazy because it, again, in comedy, I just don't know. You know, The Big Sick is coming out. It has a 97 on uh, Rotten Tomatoes. It's, it's been platforming and doing great. And then it, it goes wide. And I can't tell you if it's gonna break through or not break through. I, it deserves to, uh, and I hope it does. But that's what's interesting, and that's what you know keeps me fascinated and working is, I you know you can't just relax because I always say you know you're always three movies away from being kicked out of the business. You know you'd have you'd have one bomb, they'll let you make another with a slightly lower budget, and if that bombs, they're going to give you a really low budget, and if that bombs, you're done. And so you're 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 aware of that in in some way, and it keeps you. Uh, Focused. How long after a movie comes out, it does really well. How long does the honeymoon period last for you? If it does, like how well, how long do I feel good exactly. for? Yeah. I don't. I don't even have the moment. <laughs> really? I usually have the moment of joy when we show the movie for the first time and realize it's good. But by the time we're releasing it for real, I'm usually thinking about another movie, and I'm nervous if that one's going to come out well. I'm not very outcome oriented. I, I like to be working and solving problems, but if something is done and I like it, I'm not obsessive about this needs to be giant. I want it to do really well, but my, my nerves are more about making bad things than they are about making successful things. So I, I want the success. My kids will tell you the day walk hard didn't make money, they, I was so depressed it haunted them for years. You know, so, so it's not like I don't have that. But what is most concerning is in the middle of the shoot of the Big Zig, watching dailies, going, I, I hope this makes sense. Like that's the, the scary moment. And then when you know, oh, it does make sense, that's the happy moment. And then the money thing, it comes or it doesn't. Sometimes you think it doesn't matter because there are things you've made that didn't do well in the box office, and then you notice, wow, people are still talk about funny people all the time. And even though it did, you know, fine, but not giant, you realize, oh, it's penetrated in some way. Like people are going back to it. People are watching it. It's important to people. And so the success isn't necessarily in the money in the box office. It really is in, does this project survive? Do people care about it?